Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our Salon series. I'm really incredibly honored to have Pat here today. And um, since my first kind of digging into Foresight's archive, I was really intrigued with your work. Uh, and it's pretty aligned with our mission. And the, really, the more I read about it, um, the longer I wish we had today to talk about all of it. Um, you're a sociologist, a philosopher, and a pioneer of information technology. And your motto is quite simple, which is that... I have many models. Computer, it? yeah, okay, you have many models. So one of them is at least computer interfaces should be so simple that a beginner in an emergency can understand it in seconds. That was a long time ago, though. And, okay, I'll give you the second one, and I wasn't quite sure whether I should voice it right in the, in the beginning. That's the fire extinguisher model, and it <laughs> applies in a number of places. Okay, how about this one? Most people are fools. Most authority is malignant, God does not exist, and everything is wrong. <laughs> I've mellowed slightly on the first one. All right, cool. Just, just FYI. Well, anyways, to like make things a little, a little less wrong, um, you then set out to make computers accessible, right? You wrote and invented countless amazing pieces, many of which will be going around here. 117, according to Lowood's bibliography. All right, 117. That's not including handouts, which are uncountable. Uncountable but, but handouts. The, but published, uh, 117 published works. Oh my God, here we go. Well, we won't go through them all tonight, but you have like a curated sub-selection of those. Some of those pieces are here, but you also pioneered hypertext, which I'm sure many of you know here, and then most importantly, dedicated yourself to Project Xanadu. And I really have to say, I have a lot of respect for the integrity and determination with which you have pursued this goal that's not only incredibly ambitious, um, but has the potential to really radically transform one of the areas that really may be most fundamental and impactful for our collective future, which is the way that we handle information. So please help me welcome Ted Nelson. Thank you. <laughs> All righty. Uh, who is Wait, taking a word on A word on what we're handing out here. First, you, you can look at it. Oh. And then, we'll, so this is number, handout number one. I did this when I was 19. I have no idea how I did it. But I was a media inter innovator at 19, and this magazine <coughs> is the proof of it. And, um, and uh, we were going to pass a, a new thing every five minutes so that by the end of the talk, probably all of these will have circulated. They're no wow, I am in the front seat yeah. here. Yeah. That's amazing. It's a zine. What, what would you like to show us here? Because oh. I could jump right into the questions, and you may not have a chance anymore to show us anything you, right. you, you had wanted to abdicate us. First of all, I put this on YouTube yesterday. This, was, this is a 20th anniversary reply to the attack in Wired. I'll give you the first minute of it. Hi, I'm Ted Nelson, recording on the 29th of June, 2015. This is an anniversary video. It's a big anniversary for me. I'm a controversial figure, which means that a lot of people dislike me. Like Al Gore, I have become a convenient clown meme to the underinformed. I hope my work will someday be seen to have depth and integrity, ideally in my lifetime. But meanwhile and always, I must deal with a singular blot on my escutcheon, the scurrilous attack by Wired magazine. This month is the 20th anniversary of that attack. The article pretended to be a history of my Project Xanadu, but its main intention was to destroy my reputation, my career, and indeed my life, and it did a very good job. So you can, that's, that's the top of my YouTube channel, which is uh, youtube.com slash the Ted Nelson. Okay, so I'm going to give you a few minutes of this one. This is called Xanadu Basics 1A, and I, and, and I will simply talk about parallel pages with visible connection, which is the one thing that I'm, I'm still fighting for and we don't have. Why don't we have parallel pages within, with visible connection? Because Chuck Simone, John Warnock, and Tim Berners-Lee didn't think you needed them. So now here we go. Here is a mock-up I did in the 1960s. I faked it with a typewriter, a neighbor, and some plastic. That's not a real computer screen. Nobody had them at the time. And here's the close-up. It's been 50 years since then, but in the years since, especially in the 30 years that people have had computer screens, my software teams have created a number of prototypes you can actually open and manipulate. I'll talk about my teammates and where to find the software in another video, Xanadu Basics 2. 
So here are some examples of connected parallel pages you can actually play with. This is the Xanadu space package in various versions showing connections of an essay to its sources and comments. The blue connections are links. The pink connections show the original sources. That was the essay Origins that I'm quite proud of, with links and sources. Now here's a version that's easier to read, except with no links, just the sources showing. This is the same essay without links, but connected to its sources in an interactive web page that you can open and easily step to the sources. It's easy to step to each source. There's lots more in Xanadu, in, in this one, Xanadu Basics 1A, and Xanadu Basics 2, which is much longer and goes into considerable detail. And I think we'll be touching on some of those later, so maybe we can like bring up like parts of it like uh, throughout the discussion when we actually get into the nitty-gritty uh, bolts of it and why, why they are now more important than ever to have. But um, when we discussed you know, the Salon, we were tossing around a few titles and we ended up with there's too much to say and it goes in all directions, so um, I you know, if there's really one thing that we know today is that we won't cover it all, right? But I'll give you a lay of the land of the topics that I'd like to talk about today and, you know, let's see where we diverge from it and where we actually end up. But I'd love to cover, uh, to start with Computerlib, uh, then go to the grand goal of Xanadu, then the individual features of, of Xanadu and how they would address a few of the problems that we're now facing with the World Wide Web. And then finally, like, have some concrete action items of how we could do better in the future. Um, so, um, a pretty small goal for today and I think if we find other directions we can diverge there and please feel free to chime in. And if you want to give people like a little bit of a preview of what they can expect in Computerlib, what motivated you to, to write it? What is it about and how is it connected to Dream Machines? As a kid, I was, all, I was, a, I was a, uh, an explorative, exploratory futurist. So, for example, um, I wanted to have my own Earth satellite in 19... Um, when Willie Lay's book came out, and so when, when, they, when the first Sputnik came up, my, my reaction was, what took them so long? I was into Buckminster Fuller when I was 10. When I got to the computer, I said, holy smoke, they've been lying. It's not mathematical. It's not uh, an engineering device. It's an all-purpose machine. You can put screens on it. I'm a filmmaker. Oh, yeah, I made a movie in college, which I'm very proud of. You can see that on YouTube. So... <coughs> So I, I thought I was going to be a Hollywood director. Eventually my father became a Hollywood director, which surprised me, but I did not. Um, as soon as I saw that you could put screens on computers, I said, holy smoke, that's it. The interactive screen will be the new home of the human race. Was I wrong? So I figured I was uniquely qualified to design the documents of the future because I understood literature, I understood the history of technology, I knew where things were going, and I could visualize things that nobody else could. I have a letter that I just got from Roger Levian at the RAND Corporation. I spoke at RAND in 66, uh, called Hard and Fast Thoughts for a Soft Copy World, and he said he was tremendously inspired by me because he never thought of things that way. But almost nobody could hear or understand anything I was saying for the first 10 years. So what is Computer Lib playing out? Oh yeah, so, so in Computer Lib I was trying to explain that computers are not mathematical, that they, they are there for the people, and, uh, and computer freedom is the, is the objective. And I, ha I laid out what I thought would be the, the coming paradise of computers, right? Here's my LP that I did in, in, in my junior year for, for the first rock musical. I'd, I'd worked in a number of media, films, uh, uh, recording, and, and so forth. It, it's interesting, I took a, a personality test um, at data point. It's very peculiar. They gave me a personality test, and it said I was a producer-director type. I didn't know there was such a type, but I guess so. So the point is, if when, I, when I put out my magazine, you know, I... I, I uh, commissioned the, the, uh, the cartoons from Russ Ryan when I did my musical, I commissioned the music from, from Dick Kaplan. So putting, putting together packages. So this I did all by myself. Computer Lib was an introduction to computers, and Dream Machines was about the wonderful new worlds of, of, uh, that computers would make possible. And uh, it took me two years on the kitchen table, and nobody knew what I was doing. Uh, and uh, explaining it to the printers was very difficult. 
But it was like nothing number three that I passed around. It was uh, it, once, once everybody understood what it was, we finally got it together. And uh, it was a surprise hit in ways I didn't expect. I thought it, would, it was for the public. No. The public couldn't understand a word. But it turned out to be a Bible for computer hobbyists and, and visionaries everywhere. So it sold 50,000 dollars, 50,000 copies. I was cheated by my distributors. It turns out I'm not a businessman. And so I didn't get paid. Uh, at any rate, it had tremendous influence. It went to the Homebrew Computer Club in, in, uh, in uh, Palo Alto or wherever, wherever the seat was. And, uh, and, and it inspired Wozniak to create the Apple I. It inspired everybody to, to want to build computers and, uh, and uh, was considered, quote, a Bible there. Now, the Dream Machine side was, was interestingly influential because the people in computer assisted instruction had never heard of this, the people in computer graphics had never heard of that, the people in artificial intelligence, they, all of them were surprised to learn about the other branches they hadn't heard of, but being a generalist and trying to sweep in things from all over. I mean, I was reading so many different computer magazines. I was I subscribed to the journal, I, I was a member of the ACM and read numerous computer magazines at the same time I was teaching sociology at Vassar. So it was, in fact, Jason Scott just was helping me with my storage containers in New Jersey, and, he, and I said, oh, that's junk mail, let's throw it away. He said, no, and he's put it on the Internet Archive. It's been a popular item because I, I opened and stapled and commented on thousands of different things in various, in entirely different areas because I didn't know what was going to catch on. I thought an analog computing was competing with digital at the time, and, and hybrid computing was, was when, when you combine the, the two of them. One of the things I was working on, I independently invented CGI, and uh, <coughs> but not it didn't get put together in time. But I eventually designed a hybrid computer with a backplane of triangular modules, which <coughs> held bow type shaped modules. The triangular models, modules held digital information about tri. I, I independently discovered that you could triangulate in a curved surface, which has become the popular method. Wasn't I pointed out is that you know it. It's, it was such a hit because it mimics the way that the brain thinks. You know, it was all over the place and like had like multiple different chunks that connected it in different ways with each other. Well, who knows how the brain thinks, but cer certainly there are connections in all directions. As, yeah. as I said, in Lo and Behold, the point is that, that writing is illicit because you're taking a tapestry, a panorama of information, and reducing it to a small pipeline of words. Uh, this is beautifully stated in, in John McPhee's piece, Structure, from The New Yorker, which you can look up. And the point is that, that then, the, then the reader must reassemble that, that structure of, of interconnection. What I've tried to do with the few Xanadu designs I've come up with has been to extend, in a, in a very simple way, sequential writing into parallel text. All right. Well, if we want to pass it around. No, that's number, is, is number three yeah, around? It's, okay. It's There's number four. We're on it now. <laughs> yep. So I think one thing, you know, that, that you say in Dream Machines is, and it included kind of lyrics from like a Sanadu like singing commercial, right? Yep. And it, they said, the greatest thing you've ever seen, dance he wishes on the screen. All the things that man has known coming on the telephone. Poems, books and pictures too coming on the Sanadu. So if we want to start with Sanadu, right? Um, there are like poems written about Sanadu. There's like, like a, a really nice, I think, confounding history about the name as well. And maybe you, you can get into it. but. Could you elaborate uh, and get everyone up to speed on what is Project Xanadu and what was the f what set you what what did you set out to do when you started it? Well, first of all, Xanadu is a real place. It was yeah. the summer palace of Kublai Khan, who was a great conqueror. Marco Polo claims to have reached him, and I think all the evidence indicates that he actually did. And he told Marco Marco to Polo to come back with a hundred Christian missionaries and they'd argue it. The current government says that Xanadu was this particular place, but I believe that my colleague Rob Smith has actually found the location. We have a satellite photograph, it's for about 400 kilometers north of Beijing, and it exactly matches the uh, description by Paul. So it's a, rect a rectangle divided into sub-rectangles. It became the centerpiece of one of the most monumental pieces of, li of English literature called Kublai Khan, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who uh, had a vision of it in the dream. So it begins, In Xanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf, the sacred river, ran through caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. 
But oh, that deep romantic chasm which slanted down the green hill athwart a cedarn cover, a savage place as holy and enchanted as e'er beneath a waning moon was haunted by woman wailing for her demon lover. Now, this, this had nothing to do with the actual place. There was no Alf, the sacred river, but, but, but I, I, took, I took this as symbolic because... Uh, I knew there was oh, some oh, opium yes. involved. Well, never mind that. <laughs> but, but Coleridge claims to have been interrupted in writing down the poem by a certain person from Porlock, some suburb of London, who bothered him on business for an hour, and the rest of the poem is lost. So the idea was that my Xanadu would be the, plat the magic place of literary memory where nothing would be forgotten. And, uh, and, uh, and Alf, of course, was the alphabetical stream of, uh, the Alf, the sacred river, was a stream of characters. So I adopted the name when I was at Harcourt Brace. Uh, I was assistant to the president of Harcourt Brace in 1966. I got the dates wrong in some place, but I've, I've now found the, the, the actual dates. Well, we've got them on record now. Yeah, yeah. And so in September 66, I actually flew out to see Doug Engelbart. In my autobiography, I said I, that Yovanovitch came with me, but apparently he didn't. I saw him, I saw Engelbart alone, and so this was two years before Doug's great demo, and, and, um, but I saw, I saw all the stuff. And so what was Xanadu set out to do? Uh, originally, it was just a proposal <laughs> <laughs> to put an inadequate machine in at Harcourt that I thought would do much more than it would. Digital equipment had not yet announced the deck 338, which was an interactive console based on the trivial PDP-8 machine. And somehow I thought it could be time shared and, 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 and put in this proposal. Little knowing, of course, that in a corporate environment where you had an IBM department, no way was the IBM department going to allow a machine from a, from a rival computer company. Uh, you have to know that uh, something I learned, I didn't learn until, it took another lesson. In the corporate environment, your enemy is not the corporate corporate competition, it's the other department. And, 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 and knowing that is, 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 is a key to corporate success. So I chose the name Xanadu in, in, 80, in, in 66, but then it was, just going, and it was just going to be the name of this hypothetical project. I then started outlining and designing how it should look on the screen. So I came up with the idea of parallel pages and visible connections, apparently in 1970, but not explicitly until the publication in 1972. In the Middle Ages and in the 19th century, you could have annotations, intercalary annotations between the lines of text. You could have marginalia, marginal notes. And marginal notes, as I, if you look at my Xanadu Basics 1A, <coughs> I, I present marginal notes as they existed in the Middle Ages and up until the 19th century, and indeed into the 20th century, printed in books. But the computer guys, when they, the, the techies, when they started making documents, never thought of that. You have Microsoft Word, which is one long formatted thing, and you have, uh, and which, well, you had Project Bravo at Xerox Park, and there they put fonts on the screen, and that's where it all went wrong. Because everybody fell so in love with fonts, and I love fonts. I designed a font in college. I haven't been able to find it yet. <laughs> But more important than fonts are the words and connections. And being able to show connections is far more important than underlining them or, 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 or having them blink or, 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 or making them uh, into Bodoni or something. So, so the point is that, that we want, as far as I'm concerned, we want parallel pages with visible connection. And that's one of the things I've been working on all this time. Now, that entered into the, into the Xanadu specs in 1970. <coughs> And, and more explicitly a little later on. When I got the team together in 1979, and two of the members are here tonight, Mark Miller I worked with first, and Roger Gregory I've been working, collaborating with for 40 years. We designed the, what I refer to now as the main Xanadu, <laughs> which, which, which was, the, which was uh, we called it 88.1, or, or now it's public sourced under the name Udenax Green. And that, I, I, I set the team, we had five people, I set them the task in the summer of 1979 of designing the software for servers and client software that would allow multiple versioning and interconnection between contents and showing connections on the screen. And it took all summer, first, first, for them to, first to accept the specs and then to design 
the internal structures. Now, I have a number of inventions to my credit. One is the Enfilade, which is a, a way of managing content by, hierarchy, by, by, by tree structure editing. So you don't have to bring a document all into memory at once. Now, back in the day with the original word processor, you'd bring the whole document into RAM and then you'd modify it, spit it out again. Hello, what do you do with something that's long? So you have to, you have to be able to point at what's outside, outside main memory and be able to edit that. And, and the Enfilade was a way of doing this without moving anything around. Whether it evolved into the piece table as used by Microsoft, I'm still trying to find out. All oh, right. Well, I think like, you know, um, kind of talking about like a few of the um, kind of like inventions that you, in you were introducing there, um, you know, that would be really, really useful to have right now, right? There's like one, if you want, want to say a few words about those and then we can say of like, we can talk about like how they would be valuable now. Hyperlinks, transclusion and uh, then micropayments. I don't use the word hyperlink. What word would you like to use? <laughs> I use the word jump link. Jump link, Because guys. you're jumping into darkness, you don't know what's there. Let's go maybe go through like a few of the features and let's also discuss like what could they have prevented now? Like how would where, where are we now? Which is hyperlinks or jump links? Oh, well, no. The, and backlinks. Backlinks. Well, backlinks implies that there's a link pointing one way and a link pointing the other. Uh, so, excuse me, but the, you can also have a, a unit which is a link which can be followed in either direction. What's the benefit of having those? My objective has been to create a literary genre superior to sequential text. Yes. And being able to follow in the classic Xanadu model links and transclusions and the, the one I just showed, Xanadu Space, which you can run under Windows and you can download the installer from the Internet Archive. That does, that does both. So that allows you to follow links and transclusions, meaning the, tr the transclusion jumps you to the place in the original source from which it, each part was taken. So this is a proposed literary genre. In fact, it, you can say it's a real literary genre in that it was implemented, but not being widely distributed mm -hmm. or, or available, it, 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 it's, right now it's on the sidelines. Yeah. Okay. But, <coughs> but the point being that it is a, an understandable spec which is simple and clear and yet does a number of things you want. One is authentication of content, one is looking at, looking at original context, one is uh, allowing users to, excuse me, <laughs> allowing users to create their own connections any way you like. So, th so the, the arbitrary connections, which may be followed in either directions, are Xanalinks, not, not, not jump links. Can you please explain the difference between that and hyperlinks and anchor points on the World Wide Web? The World Wide Web gives you one column. I want to give you multiple columns side by side with visible connections between them. Let's go there again. We'll look at this one for a moment. This is Cosmic Book, another prototype by a different method from the others. But we see visible connections. See, visible connections. You see, that's a visible connection, right? In the different pages. Here we have a Xenodoc. Right now, it's disguised as plain text. But if we want to see connections, here they are. The ones outlined in blue are Xenolinks. They aren't just jump links, what other people call hyperlinks. I've called them jump links since before the web. You're jumping to you know not where. It's a diving board into darkness. Whereas Xenolinks visibly connect to other content with a visible bridge. The other documents open and I can scroll around in them. When I click, I close them again by clicking. This is, of course, only one possible interface. Well, uh, I think you know. I think we can definitely have like a, a Q and A going, like just maybe to like you know get us going on why I think this would be valuable to have. You know, currently is that like it would be useful to know like when I'm writing an argument, not only what is the argument, but also what are objections to that particular piece, right? So currently, you know, what we have with, like, it could enable something like a real meritocracy debate, right, by which you can follow back claims and arguments to their source, right? And I think why it would also be useful, apart from just, you know, um, delivering more of a meritocracy debate, is also because you, ha you could 
by that perhaps peers echo chamberization because by you know having texts that link to different parts of the text and having them having links go both ways you you wouldn't have just like a document exists in its own echo chamber but you could actually pierce those echo chambers that's that was my initial thought when i was thinking well how would those uh, items be useful right now what would they be doing with the world wide web as we currently see it how could they be helping problems that we currently see in the world wide web one of it is obviously that you know much of the discussion that we're having is not really based on facts and another one is that you know the discussions that we're having are moving further and further away from each other into their own echo chambers and i think by something like having those jump links and especially if they're both ways you can uh, you can solve both problems one by you know really linking to the references but also secondary by like leading like by leading out of, out of your echo chamber would you agree with that would you have anything to add no that, that's good yeah yeah okay well and then i think you know um, while i'm at it uh, stop me if I'm if, if I'm making claims where I don't think uh, where you don't think that they're useful. But like thinking about transclusions, for example, I think um, they would be really valuable to have because transclusions actually like instead of copying, uh, instead of quoting someone um, from a different text where you can always take a quote of, out of context, with what a transclusion would actually do is that you would see that uh, the original quote basically that you're referring to in its original context. Why is that important? Because oftentimes quotes that you have get taken out of context. Well, look at email all the time. You hear, hear somebody say that said something, but what was the context in which you see it? You can see that it's been it's come from some other email, but you can't see what the original context was. Yeah. And that's so, just one important use. Yeah. So taking things out of context is, I think, a thing where it's not necessarily malignant or like it's not necessarily obviously bad, but it oftentimes leads to like not clear lies, but still people, you know, like being let down at a, a wrong path. And another thing that you know we haven't talked touched on yet, but I just want to give you a lay of the land, and then we can like uh, dive deeper into some of them. Is that what uh, those transclusion, what transclusions basically allow, is that you have those uh, once you link to those once you link to those pieces, you basically have something where you can now charge for that content. So you could whenever I'm whenever I'm referencing something that Ted has said. You know, I'm like, you know, transcluding his item and then I could give him something like a micropayment in which I acknowledge that I've, I, I'm using his content. And what that obviously does is that we don't, wouldn't end up with the current in, uh, in infrastructure of the Internet by which we pay by ads and with our data and information. But you could actually have a pretty straightforward uh, context in which you pay for the information that you're receiving via those. I had, a long, I had a long argument with Tim Berners-Lee on this in, in 1996 in Tokyo. And he said, oh, no, we can't have payment. Now he's coming around. We had Robin Hansen once uh, for a talk, and he wrote this book on elephant in the brain, where he basically says that, you know, like, oftentimes things don't work because you're actually not giving people what they actually want. So I think that, you know, I was worried that even with something like transclusions and with something like, you know, jump links where you could be tracing back an argument to the original source, people just would never check it. And in fact, yeah, and in fact, you may be opening up, like, a trapdoor to your own writing because when you're writing something, a lot of people may suddenly link to their content, uh, which you know could uh, on which they could perhaps link to malware, but they could also just link to really like like mimetically toxic content that may destroy your argument. So I was just thinking like, is the like is the psychological problem that we have in which we you know just often becomes like a shout a shouting war? Is that something that may be so deep enshrined that like even with hyperlinks you may have something? where we don't end up in a good scenario, but you're shaking your head, Mark. You, d you disagree? We have a thing called Hover Cards. Mm -hmm. We built it. I'm a Cisco guy. Okay. Hover Cards on Twitter allows you to see that. That's why we win the ransom wars, because we have sourcing. And I agree that somebody screwed up the internet. Tim Berners-Lee and them may not have did what they should have done. But says an iTunes guy to actually help people pay for content they actually worked on? I actually think he was right on the process. And people like, actually, and Mark Andreessen has admitted this, when they cut off annotations in the browser, they made it impossible for people to give attribution and also a voice about whether the content and what they thought about the content, which is metadata. It's back in the browser standards now. It was put in last year. Okay. So structurally, I don't want to take too long, but I want to correct this informational point. He's right. We do need the ability to do that. But it's not just X, Y anymore. It's Z space. That's why the annotations, or what we call the dress layer, we're talking about is it over with, allows everyone to be able to make notations about some information. And therefore, we can get collective consensus. The question is, are we using them? Or would people use them or not? Allow but me to reply to that in part. Yeah. And, that is, <laughs> and having a lot of people being able to make 
annotations on the same thing in one <coughs> uh, page. One page mm -hmm. is not at all what we're talking. What I'm talking about. That's that's that is an adaptation which creates a a, uh, a crowd on the side, but does not have the literary punch that I'm trying to create with this genre. Well, I, I wouldn't know about literary. I only saw it coming in. All right, Mark, you were shaking your head. Do you think? Um, are you more optimistic about human psychology? I am altogether optimistic long term. Um, uh, one of the things in, in seeing how randomly things proceed uh, is that uh, when you look at human progress decade to decade, it seems like a random walk. But if you look, if you look at it century to century, there seems to be, you know, altogether a genuine progress. Really? Um, uh, that's my sense of it. Um, the uh, humans, uh, humans have this, humans in human culture do seem to adapt to um, uh, the informational environment that they're in, but it takes a while. Uh, I think that the, uh, the bi-directionality of links would be a tremendous improvement. I think the unidirectionality of the web is a large part of why we're getting this filter bubble phenomenon yeah. that you're talking about, uh, is that when it's much easier to follow links forward than to follow them backward, from a given document, you see what it has to say about other documents. You don't see, just looking at it, what other documents have to say about it. So there is this asymmetry of the visibility of criticism. What you're reading becomes the sort of this, this thing that gets to only defend itself. Um, and with bidirectionality, you can navigate the conversation in both directions. And I think that um, the, a lot of the, the ways in which people can get stuck in bad informational systems, uh, I think that it's early days, and people will learn from seeing other people get stuck and come up with better practices, and people will also come up with better systems like bidirectional links, um, which they should have done in the first place, but, if, if, but I think eventually they'll come up with better systems in reaction to seeing how people get stuck in current systems. Okay. That is assuming that, like, I mean, I can see how you say that because you care about the truth. But I think that oftentimes what you see on the internet is that the truth already gets out competed by a shouting war or by people wanting to signal their lo loyalty, you know, to their peer group or whatever. So I'm thinking that if you did, if you had uh, like backlinks back and forth, then the the like the backlinks of people that are interested in the truth, like oftentimes those backlinks they wouldn't really get get like followed backwards. But on the other hand. The, if you're writing something truthful, many people that you know have content that is more like let's say contrarian or polarizing could link to that to your part of the argument, and by that kind of like you know deflecting people away from the argument or making it make you know having it ha having it linked to very polarizing content. So I'm just I'm, I'm just kind of like cautious about the two 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 sidedness. But um, I'm open to yes over there in the back. Do you want to? Ted, I've been following your work intellectually and emotionally for decades. The thing I'd like to know is, how do you feel now, looking at what's happened, looking back at the kind of the twists and turns that your own career has taken and the industry has taken? What, what, is, the, what is your sense of the moment? I'm very sorry about certain mistakes I made. And um, if we'd gotten 88 out in 1988, as Roger promised, uh, we would have been out ahead of the web, so people would have seen parallel pages with visible connections. Even if the web prevailed, there would have been another model visible to the public. So I'm very ashamed of that. And uh, I'm extremely pessimistic about the future. Do you think there's... We're, the, we're, let's put it this way. Human history is approaching its climax. Do you think there is anything salvageable about the state of the web as it currently is, or do you think we have to do a tabula rasa and just Well, study? there's no, there's no, there's no doing a tabula rasa any more than there's, shall we say, erasing New York City except by rising water. Yeah. Do you think there's any, you know, particular 
let's say features you know that you envision in Project Xanadu that one could like add on to the state that the uh, or create like maybe little like Xanadu pockets. Well, I'm still I'm still working with with Edward Betts in England, and we have a new model, which will be open sourced. There's a white paper. I don't I think it's publicly available, but we haven't announced it yet. Uh, for multiple pages, and uh, and and a similar genre, we've we've we defined the flight. A flight is a set of connected pages, and so we have the flight link and a number of other of other links as part of this structure. And uh, it's all in, it's all in the white paper, which uh, I haven't thought about for several months. So some of the details at the moment elude me. Mm -hmm. But uh, but Edward is a great guy. He was at the Internet Archive with me in the in uh, fifteen years, uh, ten years ago, and and now continues in England. And what do you think? Oh, we have a few questions there. Then I'll hold on. Yeah, over there, loudly, please. Uh, what have been uh, the largest challenges to bringing this product to market? The largest challenges. <laughs> that that suggests that they're 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 popping up in a whack-a-mole sort of way, yeah. and and the and bringing any product to market. Is a is a is a problem, so 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 if you if you if you just look at uh, if you just look at uh, what a company faces trying to bring something out today. Now, since we were working much earlier, I believe I was <clears throat> a the first person ever to design interfaces for non-computer users, and I was the first independent software designer, meaning that uh, independent software developer, meaning that as an individual rather than a member of a university or a corporation. I was trying to develop this thing back in 1960. But uh, you, you cannot enumerate the challenges. You can go back historically to what the, what the possibilities might have been. But of course, the, 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 the ecology of bringing out a product now is entirely different. And do you think that, you know, like individual pieces, for example, would you already be a little bit more optimistic about the state and future of the web if something like micropayments got more um, got more traction and got actually more implemented on a wider scale, or do you think? I just see it getting worse and worse with all this white space on the side and hard carriage returns, so that you can't. So that if you enlarge the page big enough to read, you can't see the whole line on your screen. I mean, what morons these people are! They're going for some kind of aesthetic. See, it all went wrong with fonts, as far as I'm concerned. Isn't it? Well, we're waiting for yours to come out then. No, well, the point. <laughs> see, I learned to write on something called a typewriter. No fonts on a typewriter. Just one font on the typewriter, and so the the words and the lilt of the sentences became the issue. Not not being able to make something uh, to give something a punch. Well, you could underline. You have to go. You have to backspace and then hit the hit the underlined character, but but uh, or do all caps. But that was it. And so you you had to give thought to real to real. Uh, um, by the way, cut and paste. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> my first salary job was a copy boy in my hometown newspaper, the New York Times, and uh, and so a uh, a reporter would type a story. Oh, pardon me, my first task in the morning was to refill the paste pots. And each paste pot had a tube down the center and a brush in the cap, which fit down into the tube. So a reporter would type the story, then cut it up, rearrange, and put stuff in between. Now people can't imagine that this day. Because when they put out the, mag the, the Macintosh, they used the words cut and paste to justify an abominable mechanism called the clipboard. This is called a metaphor because it resembles an ordinary clipboard in every way, except you can only put one thing on it. Putting another thing on it destroys the previous contents. And in, in every other respect, it resembles an ordinary clipboard, but there aren't any other respects. So the point is that this word, th this word was used to justify this abominable mechanism. Now, let me show you true cut and paste. And here are pages from a manuscript I wrote that got flooded in a basement in 1961. And this is true cut and paste. All right, so here's. So here's, uh, here's page, uh, page two. So you can't actually see it, but there, that is a typewritten, typewritten piece that is pasted in place. And we'll go back, I'll see, I'll see if number one is the best. So, and you can, down, you can actually download this PDF and look at it in, de in detail. So that's real cut and paste. And, and there's no tool, there's no tool in the computer world 
that allows you to do this. So if you could choose one tool that you could... And by, by, and by, by the way, this also implicitly has transclusion back to the original, because I could, I could go to the original of which there was a carbon and see what the original context of each chunk was. Does everybody know what a carbon is? <laughs> back in the days of typewriters, there was something called a carbon copy. So you had a carbon copy page. So you put two sheets of paper in the typewriter with a carbon copy page in between, and it would whack, you whack the key and it would make an impression that would make a, the, the typewriter, the impression on the front was made through the ribbon of the typewriter and the impression on the back was made through the carbon paper. Anyway. Do you want to contrast the world in which we currently are, right, um, and you're not super optimistic about it, with the world in which we would have been if we had like full project Xanadu, like what, what would be like the types of interactions that you seem possible? Because it is, you know, in, in it's functioning in pretty kind of like sweeping proposal, right? That would really raise... Right. You well, you'd, you'd, be able, you'd be able to read this yeah, with the transclusion of the original, for example. Yeah. yeah. So was the, was the idea to really like raise humanity's like sanity waterline and like what, what, what types of interactions do you see would have been possible there? That's like asking... Um, what would have happened if, 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 if they'd given electric cars to people in the Middle Ages? How, how would I know? Okay, well, <laughs> hi. Functionally, what would you wish people could know or do? I wish people could know everything. <laughs> what they would do with it, I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I've always wanted to know everything, and of course, the, the, more, you lo the more you learn about any subject, the more you realize the immensity of that subject and the impossibility uh -huh. of knowing it worth a damn. But yes, I, the point is to, to extend people's understanding and, and knowledge further. I mean, it's, it's easy to know more about most subjects than most people. It's very hard to know a lot. Is that somehow the idea is there, those who can access, you know, uh, the Newton-Leibniz calculus thing, you know, that that's happening at the same time, like, how did that happen? Anyway, anything you want to say about uh, Engelbart or about that sort of simultaneous invention? Well, Engelbart and I were not on the same wavelength. Uh, and and uh, because he was a computer guy and he saw things hierarchically. And uh, in my eulogy for him, which you'll see on my, web, on my channel, uh, best thing I ever wrote, which uh, nevertheless, I thought that he kept the he put the links outside the file. No, he embedded an anchor every time a link was made, which, which is, is, is a self-defeating strategy. But, uh, but his thinking was, we will empower and raise the IQ of groups. Now, my cynicism was always that the IQ of a, of a group is like the square root of the sum of the of the IQs of the group, because, because you, the dumbest person in the room has to understand something before you can go on. <laughs> and, 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 and so committees are, are extremely uh, difficult to, to manage. He had served in the Navy, and it's been commented by a friend of mine that, that, that his view of unanimity and cooperation came a great deal from his Navy, uh, Navy experience. If you watch my, uh, a, few, a few items down on my YouTube channel is, is the talk I gave at the Engelbart 50th anniversary in December. And, uh, and he knew nothing about corporate politics, rivalry, or, or, or evil, and, and, and was not aware of the existence of these things and imagined that pure cooperation would, would, would lead us forward. In the same way, by the way, that Buckminster Fuller did. <laughs> so Bucky was trying to unify the planning of the world's resources for everyone's benefit. How about <laughs> that? Yes, sir. So, so Doug, nevertheless, did an enormous amount with his team. And after his great demo in, on December 9th, 1968, I proposed that we call, that we call uh, December 9th Doug Demo Day, uh, because that way it, 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 it empowers everyone to make that the day in which we demonstrate things. Uh, I proposed to call, in the talk I proposed to call it Doug Day, but it turned out that, that was already, hashtag Doug Day was already taken. So Doug imagined, first of all, credited with the mouse, which was trivial, uh, and a five-finger keyboard, of which I may have the only working one in existence, uh, he also essentially created outlining word processing, groupware, and a whole lot of other things that astounded the world in his great demo in 68. He'd shown it to me two years earlier. But, but the point is that, that uh, I have posted, I believe, on the Internet Archive, 
his pocket cards. The little one makes it seem simple. The big pocket card shows how incredibly difficult the system was to use. Now Doug's analogy was between a tricycle and a bicycle. It's easy to ride a tricycle, but in order to get much further, you have to learn to ride a bicycle, which is hard. I'm afraid that analogy led him to believe things had to be hard. And I, I, I actually believe that you could give all of Doug's, you could rebuild all of Doug's functionality with cascading menus. I, I broached this to Christina Engelbart, she hasn't replied. <laughs> but but Chris, Christina is now running the Doug Engelbart Institute and doing a wonderful job. Anyway, so, so Doug was the most loving person I have ever met. And this radiance suffused everything he did which was a remarkable thing considering that he was also extremely intelligent as an engineer. He had done, he had done PhD work in, 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 uh, in yoke control for, for CRTs and God knows what else. So that, so that in leading his team for the development of a huge interpersonal venture, he was doing something entirely different from his engineering background. And it was, it was an enormous achievement. And he, he, he tried everything. He brought in Werner Earhart and EST. I won't talk about that. He brought in, he had them take LSD <coughs> and, and, and the scuttlebutt was, you don't think what they're doing in there is science, do you? And finally, um, I think it was bef after his people started to leave, some AI guy just took away his office. Just, just, just persuaded, Bertram Raphael, uh, persuaded uh, his boss that, that he should have the office and got Doug's, Doug's office. So uh, accidentally at a, at a recent party, I spilled beer on Bert Raphael, so <laughs> <laughs> I felt good about that. The, your native tendencies are quite visual. My and native what? Your native tendencies are visual. Well, you yeah. See it, you, you visualize the page, you visualize the sources of the page. Yeah. Does that translate for you into any kind of aural picture? Um, do you have a soundtrack of sorts to what you can see? And or how do you feel about things like Siri voice command and uh, things like smart homes and commanding things with your voice? Well, I think those are two entirely different questions. One is about a soundtrack and, and how, how, what sounds should accompany something you're watching or seeing. Let, let, let me make a movie point, by the way. Uh, my claim has always been that software is a branch of cinema. So what is a movie? A movie is events on the screen that affect the heart and mind of the viewer. What is software? Events on the screen that affect the heart and mind of the viewer and interact and have consequences. What have you taken away from the movie? Nothing. Now, movies need a director. Someone who says, okay, we can't, put, we can't pile all that stuff in there. We have to, we have to adjust and, and simplify this and change that. Software does not have a director except Steve Jobs. He had both the power and the visualization to make things look good, feel right, and come across clear, clearly. By the way, that was my motto in the 60s. The, pro the, the problem of software is making things look good, feel right, and come across clearly. So I believe the principles of software, are of software interaction are very simple, and that's why I disagree with the Media Lab, because the Media Lab wants you to think they know something special. And, and the, real, the, the trick is there's nothing special about making things look right, feel right, and come across clearly. But it takes a director, it takes someone in charge, and there's nobody in charge as they pile more and more crap into given pieces of software. All right. Um, did that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay, over here. Mm -hmm. I have two questions. Oh, by the way, I didn't answer about voice commands, and that's entirely different. Uh, I'll start with dictation. Um, no dictation system I've ever tried has my vocabulary. And so they break every interesting word into short words. And, and make garbage out of it, so, so it's, it's useless. As far as voice commands for simple things, that's, that's trivial. At least they understand you. With my German accents, oftentimes he just ignores me. <laughs> I don't see why that's the case. Okay, <laughs> over here. People who use the internet seem to be satisfied with the experience. 
Well, that's everybody, it. isn't it? Right. So yeah. the question I have. Well, I'm not. Right. So. Neither am I. But okay. do you think that there's an app? Like, do you think you can convince people? Like, do you think it's possible to convince people that there's more to? No, because people can't imagine anything they haven't seen. People can't imagine anything they haven't seen. Just getting the idea of parallel pages with visible connections across to intelligent people is very hard. So asking them to imagine, I mean, <clears throat> in the old days they'd say, would you like to see, can you imagine this car in blue instead of red? And a few people could, but, uh, but, but, but as soon as you, as soon as you take, put, start adding properties. In addition, I think, to the things that you can see, it's also the things that are under the hood, like, uh, Mark made me aware that uh, you took it as a sacrosanct constraint that no one could tell what an individual was reading on a page. And uh, that was very different right now, right? Now you can really like see sure. where you're scrolling over, what you're reading, and you can uh, have predictive models based on that. So By the way, I just put on the web a an email from Richard Stallman. And Stallman cooperated with me in putting this on the Internet Archive, in which he said, that his work and the GNU project were inspired or negatively inspired by Project Xanadu, that he started his GNU project because of our secrecy. And he resented that. Now, why were we being secretive? Because we were afraid of IBM and we were afraid of the government. Well, in one case, we were right. Yeah. So I think the erosion of privacy is, you know, another one that you could add to the pile there. No? Absolutely. Okay, adding another one up. Although okay. there are there are supposedly private browsing pages. <laughs> okay, <laughs> supposedly good. Um, over there, yeah. What would you take from the legal system, if anything, towards I guess creating a better framework for how information can flow through human systems? Let me answer that four times. First of all, the legal system is an ontology. That is a system of controlled categories, an, an a-legal system, in which all, a large number of things have been defined by, by, by uh, law and by, 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 by legislation and by precedent into legal categories, pleadings, procedures. And everything that feeds into the legal system is eventually sliced and diced and put into those particular categories. And that's what a legal system is. So the representation of a legal system in such an ontology is a very interesting problem. Because now what's the, what's the next problem? The problem is that opposing lawyers in a given case will assign to different aspects of the case different parts, different parts of the ontology as part of the pleading. Because the defendants will say this and the, and the plaintiff will say that, and this thing here goes into that category for this side and the other category for the other. So, so there you have a war of ontologies, something like uh, you know, Godzilla versus uh, the, the swamp monster. And, and these are the same structures being applied differently by motivated parties. As a representational issue, I, I give you, <laughs> it couldn't get, much more, that's a lifetime of work right there. And, and your, your other question was, how would you extend this to the outside world? And I haven't, isn't, isn't that something like what you were saying? I haven't the damn idea. Yeah. We're seeing in the wider world this notion of an adversarial information system, where you've got different parties who are looking to sort of like frame, frame this sort of fact or this particular piece within their own context which you know, speaks to what you were trying to create. You were trying to create this potential for multiple contexts, or at least a, a, more, a more reasonable context. Uh, and again, this is, this is something that the legal system deals with as part of having this ad adversarial notion and then certain principles of fairness. And I wonder whether that level of formality is something that you see possible within the, the core legal system you First, put the legal legal system into it, into 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 into, uh, into ontologies, and then come back. <laughs> I don't. I, I can't imagine it. I mean, the fake news problem. And remember that Donald Trump studied under Roy Cohn, and Roy Cohn used the oh yeah, used the legal system. Not in the usual way. He would bring suits in the wrong jurisdictions. He would he would attack through unconventional means with, with peculiar pleadings. I have a question about your role as a revolutionary and also your 
position alongside other revolutionaries in history. Uh, I watched your um, eulogy for Doug Engelbart earlier today. It's a brilliant segment. I hope you haven't seen it. Thank you. Um, the question is, I think that revolutionaries or would-be revolutionaries often see truths that contradict the customs or rituals or tacit assumptions that the people around us have. And in your experiences over the years, have you seen any tactics or approaches that have worked better than you thought they would? And on the other side, have you seen things that you thought would work that somehow failed? Let me answer the last part first, because it's the simplest and the answer is so many things looked like they were great. For example, I really liked Flash back in the day. It was a wonderful programming anim and animation system and then Adobe ran into the ground by adding a lot of crap. Uh, <clears throat> and then there, uh, and, and you know, there was, there were gonna be standardized universal objects and, and things like that. Uh, I didn't think of myself as a revolutionary. I thought of myself as, a, as, a, as, a, uh, as an innovator. And uh, I've been compared to Thomas Paine, who was a, uh, a rabble rouser and, and a prime influence on the early uh, colonists who rebel against England. But then he nearly got killed in the French Revolution because he tried to pull the same thing in France. And, uh, and, uh, but but that, he was a revolutionary. Uh, I wasn't trying, a revolutionary is trying to change the way people do things. I wasn't trying to change IBM. I wasn't trying to change digital equipment. I was trying to build something. So, so I, was, I was innovating and I, I imagined that I was an entrepreneur. Uh, unfortunately, I did not find my, uh, uh, let's put it this way. In Hollywood, brother teams do extremely well. Walt Disney had his brother Roy. Who's heard of him? <laughs> and 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 uh, and the Matrix was made by a brother team, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, because that's the one person you know won't betray you in the Hollywood scheme. And and uh, and uh, so so Wozniak had his jobs. Uh, I can't. Oh, pardon me. Uh, Gates had his uh, Paul Allen. I guess I, I'm not analogous to either of those pairs, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> but I, I didn't find the the, the uh, sort of business person who would, have, who would have helped me along, which would have been great. Given you know, the state of the World Wide Web today, I think much of it you know, would have been helped along. Like when I you know, like read through a lot of your stuff, I was like, wow, you know, like transclusion, they would solve like, a bunch of the problems that we're currently facing, right? With like, misciting and like, with not getting to the source of it and with not knowing the intentions of why you're citing something or you know, where the context is. You know, something like you know, double links, is, it's a very similar case. And you know, micropayments for sure. I think you know is what like people are looking into. Double links. You mean jump one links. way links point one way links pointing in each direction. Tim Berners Lee yes. had a, he had two way links in his first version. That was a single server. Okay, good. The jump links then. Yeah. Now microcosm, which was inspired by Xanadu, actually had links in the database. So the link was a link was a first class object, and and that made it easy to to pull them up. And so that's an entirely different way of doing it. But uh, what what microcosm? Are you Okay, Microcosm was a product developed by Wendy Hall at the University of Southampton, and uh, it was a hypertext package, and the links went both, and I, I believe a first class object means something can, that can be referred to and called up by itself. Is that right? So, uh, so you, had a, you had a database of, of, of links, and you could, you, could either, you could follow them in either direction because you pull up the link. And, you, and I think you could also follow, you could find the link from the, from the thing it was pointing at as well. So that was, it was a, it was a very nice package, it didn't catch on. And it was a, it was a business venture as well. T.S. Eliot had a quote, there's nothing quite as important that can happen to a nation as the creation of an, another form of verse. <laughs> now, now that might be pushing a little bit, but Allison, what I'm hearing from you, is kind of like searching for a psychic framework instantiated in technology that basically will better some kind of moral situation. And that's not what I'm hearing from Ted. Ted, am I correct in that? 
Well, I'm not talking about morality here. Yeah. I'm not mentioning moral situation. I'm, I'm, I'm advocating something because I believe in it, and if you call that moral, well, I suppose no, it's moral. No, no, you, you, you're an innovator who thinks you have a better system. Yeah. And, I'm and I think people would, everybody would like it if I could give it to you. So. Yes, I'm hearing, I'm hearing subtext from many of the questioners that the future will be better if we have some better system. Uh -huh. Am I hearing this correctly? Uh, well, I think I was skeptical about like just our innate psychology and how it would interact with any better system and whether it would latch on or not. But I think I was partially convinced by Mark's claim that you know maybe we just have to run it for longer and then see how we adapt to those uh, technological systems. So, yeah, I guess I'm I'm on the fence there, but. Yeah, I do. I it was it's it just always like for me digging into Forsyth's archives, seeing that like and into like you know the Internet Archive for that matter, seeing that like really good ideas have been around for a really long time, and then like loads loads of people you know like me included show up on the scene and think like oh we've invented this yesterday. I think having context about like you know what things were proposed, you know like. And, and then also seeing how long they've been around for, frankly, is always just really flabbergasting to me. So I'm, I'm really intrigued of like providing some context for the technologies that we're using, that there are actually solutions that are being proposed, or at least like coherent frameworks, and you know, pushing forward so that we find a way of how to like make them interoperable again with the systems that we're using, because clearly they're failing us in some regard. Ted, what do you think we can learn from this? Well, uh, did I say this at the beginning? When, 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 when people ask me to, to speak, I say, how long can I talk? <laughs> and the usual answer I get is, uh, uh, as long as you like, within reason. And I say, which is it? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I spoke at the University of Toronto, uh, it was eight hours before we were down to six people and we all went out to eat. Well, that's, I think, what I... <laughs> that's, <laughs> That's what I was alluding to when I said in the beginning, the more I dig, the, the more time I wish we had. And it's good that we don't have to stop right now, but we can still be here for a little while, correct? Yes? All right, so... Keep going as long as anybody wants to. So for that, I thank you for now, and I think we should take it uh, to the table where foods and snacks await and some, like, uh, some drinks as well. I think that would, uh, that would definitely elevate the discussion to another level. <laughs> All right, thank you so, so much, Ted. Yeah.